After people prevented the army convoys from entering the city, there was a stalemate. During this lull, people were at a loss and didn't know what to do next. This happened over and over again during the movement. Following each new escalation, people fell into a state of confusion. No one knew what to do or what to expect. So students simply hung around the square waiting. At night, music drifted from different parts of the square. Once, I was awakened after midnight by a rowdy concert. People were shouting and laughing, making a huge ruckus. Popular music, of course, came from the West. When young people try to express themselves, to sing about their own concerns, it's really a form of liberalization. That's why this music was such an important part of the movement. When someone takes part in a rock concert, that kind of crazy feeling is all about self-liberation and about self-expression. The new music came via Hong Kong and Taiwan. One of the most famous Taiwan singers was Ho Dijian. Ho moved to the mainland in 1983 in search of his roots. He was the first pop star to appear on national television. Our culture, as well as the political system in mainland China, suppresses the individual and promotes the collective. Collectivism and patriotism are used to make the majority serve the few. The message is, you are not allowed to care about yourself. Any concern about personal interest simply means that you are selfish. I call the 1989 movement a self-liberation movement. I don't like calling the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949 liberation. Did Mao really liberate the Chinese people? Gradually people realized, we're not really liberated. We want to liberate ourselves. But Mao didn't want that. Later, Deng Xiaoping didn't want that either. During the movement, everyone wanted to release their pent-up anger and frustration. How come you can liberate me, but I can't liberate myself? Many people in Beijing felt it in those days of protest, the sense of being lifted out of their daily drudgery by a cause greater than themselves. Maybe now, through real democracy, a perfect society was possible. <laughs> there was a heightened sense of community, of giving, of shared sacrifice. It was said that even the thieves had gone on strike for the common good. In the vast square, in this space designed to make the many feel as one, a space dedicated to the manufacturing of public life, 
The personal gesture now became significant, each small act of generosity seeming to prophesy a new way of living together, a new civility. It was a feeling as intense as it was transitory. I watched the student movement on TV. It was exciting to see so many people demanding democracy. But I was worried by the general intangible nature of their demands. In China, all information is so tightly controlled by the Communist Party that people whose lives are run by this huge machine have no idea how it really works. So they usually behave in one of two ways. They either accept party rule passively or summon the courage to try and smash it all to pieces. But what happens after it's been smashed? Faced with a territory and a population to govern, the student leaders on the square found themselves recreating in miniature all the real-life problems of having and holding power. External threats of government repression meant enforcing internal security. Disagreements with the leadership were labeled betrayal, sabotage, by the familiar small handful of plotters. Struggles between the groups vying for power in the square grew increasingly ugly. As commanders, we tried to make our decision-making process as open as possible. But many students still felt that they had no normal channels through which to express their opinions. When they wanted to be heard, they'd try to seize power. Some student guard units were formed in a bizarre way. Someone from the square would run to the train station to meet newcomers from the provinces. He'd announce, I am the commander of the student security guards. Come with me. The square needs you. So the newcomers, who had no idea what was going on, would become the guy's guard. Then they'd surround the student headquarters or the broadcast station and drive away our guards. Once they took control of the broadcast station, they were in power. Often we had to suppress three or four coups a day. At the time I even joked. Now I finally understand why Li Peng wanted to suppress the students. Once I made a suggestion to the students, that was around May 23rd, I said, why not hold an election at the square or on your campuses? One student, one vote and elect leaders of the student union. But they felt elections were unthinkable in the middle of all that chaos. Then a week later, I heard that the students were setting up a democracy university in the square. I thought, well, that suggestion of mine was at the level of a democracy kindergarten. You people didn't like it. So now you're setting up a democracy university. But no matter what, you still have to vote. By the end of May, the students' resources, financial, political, and emotional, were running low. And the square was getting more squalid every day. Some concerned intellectuals had set up joint meetings involving workers and citizens groups, the independent student unions, and the Defend Tiananmen Square headquarters. They had been meeting regularly since May 23rd. Wang Dan acted as liaison among them. At a meeting on May 27th, Chai Ling and Feng Tsong De reported on the situation in the square. The impression we got was that things were really chaotic. There was endless factional infighting, and sanitary conditions were terrible. We began to doubt whether anything positive could come out of this ongoing stalemate. So we drafted a proposal. The vote in favor of it was unanimous, including Chai Ling. Later, we held a press conference in the square to announce this proposal.
After the press conference, Li Lu raised objections to our proposal. Then Chai Ling changed her mind and decided to oppose it too. The people who made the decision to leave the square on May 30th had a very negative effect on the movement. I attended the meeting, but I didn't realize at the time how harmful the decision would be. The real issue at the meeting was that some people were trying to use the movement to make themselves famous, and we opposed this. I want to say to everyone that the square is our only stronghold. If we lose it, the conservatives will overrun China. I regret we didn't debate the issue further. Although we had many good arguments in our favor, we felt we couldn't compete with the emotional appeal of their position. So we gave up. I think we should have acted more responsibly. After that, I thought that any attempt to influence the situation on the square would be futile. There was nothing more I could do. So I decided to go back to campus and do what I could to further democracy there. Why did the students want to stay at Tiananmen? Because our goal was to awaken the people. Tiananmen is the symbol of our people's republic. When we took action there, we were telling people throughout the country that there were still some of us who dared to fight back. A lot of students felt that the longer we held out, the more time people would have to think freely. We held a meeting at the square every night. Two to three hundred representatives from the various universities would get together. The issue of whether or not to leave came up almost every time. At least 80 percent of the students always voted to stay. If we were to stick to the principle of majority rule, it was impossible to leave the square. The student population at the square was constantly changing. As those who grew discouraged or disgusted left, they were replaced by enthusiastic newcomers from all over the country. At any one time, there was a majority on the square who would vote to stay. Those who thought it best to leave voted with their feet. As the students debated whether or not to continue their occupation of the square, a marathon benefit concert was being held on a racetrack in Hong Kong. Millions of dollars were raised for the movement in Beijing. That night, a shipment of tents and other supplies arrived at the square, the first installment in a flood of support from Hong Kong. Chai Ling had successfully resisted their proposal to move the struggle back to the campuses and allied herself once more with those determined to hold the square. On the following morning, she contacted American journalist Philip Cunningham. I have been feeling very sad recently. The students themselves lack a developed sense of democracy. To be honest, from the day I called for a hunger strike, I knew we would not get any results. Certain people, certain causes are bound to fail. I have been very clear about this all along, but I've made an effort to present a staunch image, to show that we were striving for victory. But deep down, I knew it was all futile. 
The more involved I got, the sadder I became. I already felt this back in April. All along, I've kept it to myself, because being Chinese, I felt I shouldn't badmouth the Chinese. But I can't help thinking sometimes, and I might as well say it. You, the Chinese, you are not worth my struggle. You are not worth my sacrifice. But then, I can also see that in this movement, there are many people who do have a conscience. There are many decent people among the students, workers, citizens, and intellectuals. The students keep asking, what should we do next? What can we accomplish? I feel so sad. Because how can I tell them that what we are actually hoping for is bloodshed? For the moment when the government has no choice but to brazenly butcher the people. Only when the square is awash with blood will the people of China open their eyes. Only then will they really be united. But how can I explain any of this to my fellow students? And what is truly sad is that some students and some famous, well-connected people are working hard to help the government, to prevent it from taking such measures. For the sake of their selfish interests and their private dealings, they are trying to cause our movement to collapse and get us out of the square before the government becomes so desperate that it takes action. If we allow the movement to collapse on its own, then the government will be able to wipe out all the leaders of the movement, as well as those leaders in the party and in the military who dare to oppose them, who represent the people. Deng Xiaoping has made it very clear that there is a small handful of people not only in the party and in society, but also among the students. That's why I feel so sad, because I can't say all this to my fellow students. I can't tell them straight out that we must use our blood and our lives to call on the people to rise up. Of course the students will be willing, but they are still such young children. Are you going to stay in the square yourself? No, I won't. Why? Because my situation is different. My name is on the government's hit list. I'm not going to let myself be destroyed by this government. I want to live. Anyway, that's how I feel about it. I don't know if people will say I'm selfish. I believe that others have to continue the work I have started. A democracy movement can't succeed with only one person. When Chai Ling finished her interview, she asked the American journalist to take the tape he had made out to the world. She told him she must now leave Beijing and go underground. That day, students at the nearby Central Art Academy were finishing work on a statue which they called the Goddess of Democracy. The next night, as the Goddess of Democracy moved from the Art Academy to Tiananmen, a television reporter interviewed Chai Ling in one of the new tents on the square. She had changed her mind about leaving. Tiruzhi 
适当的休息，呃，并且等待那个把心理套提质建立起来。那么今后你是不是有想要透过其他的方式来推动你们目前的这种？对我，我有这样的考虑，因为我觉得工作重点已经不在在广场上，而应该在全国各地上。本来我有一点声音，我希我很希望我到全国各地去走一走，甚至有可能到香港或者别的地方看一看，就是军情外面是怎么一种局面，我要亲自去看一看，让我决定在广场这个战役就应该打多久，有可能需要是一种什么样的效果。Democracy. The ideal everyone talked about. She stood facing Mao Zedong on the gate of heavenly peace. Mao, who had said that he too wanted democracy, mass democracy. What does democracy mean? What was it coming to mean in China? What could it be made to mean? If democracy came to China, what would she look like? Whose features would she wear? There seemed a chance, at least, that her face would look all too familiar. Although some cracks have appeared in the system over the past ten years, the way the whole nation thinks has not yet broken free of the mold created by Mao. In the past century or so, the Chinese people have shed blood time and again, without losing the courage to fight for their ideals. Each battle, however, has ended in a new tragedy, another shattered dream. I believe that what the Chinese lack is not ideals, but the means through which to realize them, not courage, but the wisdom necessary to achieve their goal. What the Chinese lack is not a heart, but a mind. During the Cultural Revolution, there was only one mind, that of Mao. After Mao's death, Hundreds of millions of minds needed to start functioning again. It is much harder for the mind to recover than the stomach. Though they gave the movement no new goals or direction, the bright new tents and supplies from Hong Kong, which included massive infusions of cash, would have lifted anyone's flagging spirits. And how did you raise the money in Hong Kong? Several, many, many ways. For example, there, there, there was one concert, concert for the democracy in China. Uh, in that concert alone, 14 million Hong Kong dollars, 14. Uh, was raised, okay, and uh, through other channels, phone in, or I mean, many, many channels, through the Federation of Student Union in Hong Kong, um, they raised more than 10 million. So we are talking about quite, quite, you know, quite some money here. International support suggested the possibility of a real victory for the movement, but money did nothing to stop the struggles for power being played out on the square. Yeah.、Uh, 呃，我在我具体不知道绑架这个事件，但是我在这之前我听到了一些反应，一些底下同学，特别是学术团的同学的反应，他们对柴林和这个李路以及冯春德同学的几个几位同领导领导同志吧，他们对工作上的失误以及财务上的混乱表示很大的有很多的意见，他们可能采取一些过激的行为，这个一点我已经很清楚，但是他们采取这种方法我是完全不同意的，因为本身这是对于人格的一种侮辱，我是坚决反对。我们本来还可以采取其他的一些比较和平和民主的方法来解决问题嘛。啊，请台林同学，你说说你对这一次绑架的原因，你怀疑是什么人原因呢？我想，种种迹象表明，这是一场有组织、有预谋的计划。
，中老师向表明，而且我们已经得到一些消息，就是政府已经在收买一批学生中的便捷分子，主要他们想大力的破坏和削减广场的组织领导力量，让。整个葬送我们这样学院。我觉得继续 holding on to the square like this was absolutely meaningless, and I felt it was harmful to the students' cause. One day, a friend of mine, who was a fairly well-known intellectual, came to see me. I told him that I had been going to the square every day to persuade all of my students to leave, but he said the students should not leave. He said, "With the students at the front lines, we'll be safe." Once the students withdraw, the government will come after the intellectuals. I was furious. I said, so you want the students to shield you from danger? What right do you have to hide behind them? Why don't you try living in the square like that? It's easy for you to talk, never missing a meal and sleeping in your own comfortable home. After the May 27th decision to leave was overturned by people like Chai Ling, the students were in a predicament. They couldn't leave, yet by simply hanging on, the movement was losing its appeal, and the number of people coming to the square was dwindling. In our joint meetings, the discussions focused on how to straighten things out in the square. The students should either take the initiative to leave, or stay on but improve their image. They couldn't afford just to sit there passively. But none of us could come up with anything practical. So I thought I might as well go on a hunger strike. Liu Xiaobo told me. If we don't join the students in the square and face the same kind of danger, then we don't have any right to speak. On June 2nd, Liu Xiaobo and three of his friends set up a tent on the Martyr's Monument and began their hunger strike. There's no way for me to know whether our hunger strike had affected the government's decision to launch the bloody crackdown. If it did, I would feel guilty for the rest of my life. From the moment I walked out of the square, my heart has been heavy. After all that bloodshed on June 4th, I've never gotten over this. The four men saw their hunger strike as a chance, maybe the last chance, to persuade the students to live up to their democratic goals and make their own decisions rather than reacting to escalating government threats. We were making a plea to both the government and the students to abandon the ideology of class struggle, to abandon hostile attitudes and act with greater tolerance. Everyone needed to examine their own behavior. Our hunger strike was not a heroic act, but a gesture of repentance for years of cowardice by Chinese intellectuals. We felt that under no circumstances should people involved in this movement act in secrecy or use underhanded tactics. That's what our fathers and grandfathers have been doing all along. If you act like the people you oppose, you'll end up just like them. And then you'll have to be overthrown. So what's the point? Why start a movement in the first place? The hunger strikers' gesture of humility and restraint had the paradoxical effect of revitalizing the flagging protest. Once again, the square filled with thousands of people. Ho Di Jen's anthem, Children of the Dragon, was the best-selling pop song ever marketed in China. Everyone knew the words.
I never thought our hunger strike would have such an impact. Once again, the square was filled with people. But they hadn't necessarily been attracted by the ideas expressed in our declaration. I think the majority of them came because we had gone on a hunger strike. And especially because the famous rock star, Ho Di Jian, was involved. There was Ho Di Jin wearing his Songs for Democracy t-shirt. He was a real pro in the way he worked the crowd. He'd call out, do you know the singer Deng Li Jun? Yes, came the reply. Then Ho would look for the pop star's signature on his t-shirt. Here she is, she's right here. The crowd went wild. The four hunger strikers were soon infected themselves by the intense emotions on Tiananmen Square, the very thing they wanted to temper. During the movement, I was so often divided. In our hunger strike declaration, I wrote about getting rid of hatred in politics and so on. But when I faced that cheering crowd and felt that we might actually defeat martial law, the voice of reason left me. Once you get involved in the actual situation, it was just so hard to keep a cool head, to know who the hell you are. Facing the thousands of people who cheered me on, I was completely carried away. Now here I was, speaking at Tiananmen Square, I felt that my words could sway the fate of the nation. In the early hours of June 3rd, Army units once again attempted to get to the square. Most of the troops weren't in combat gear, but people were outraged to find that some were actually armed. Protesters confiscated guns, cattle prods, cleavers, and knives, and displayed them as proof that the government intended to use violence. Then they turned the weapons over to the city police. When day came, crowds had stopped buses being used to transport weapons into the city and were ejecting the soldiers. Troops stationed in the nearby Great Hall of the People were ordered out to retake the buses. They too were surrounded and stopped. So the soldiers sat down and everyone started to sing. Soldiers and protesters, each hoping perhaps to sing the other side into submission. They all sang the same few familiar songs from the days of the revolution. They sang, without the Communist Party, there is no new China, the PLA anthem, and the three disciplines and eight points of attention. Fringes of the singing match, nervous soldiers collided with excited citizens. Those hurt rushed to the square to tell their stories.
我翻过来再看看里面的血，看看抢过来的帽子，这是我抢过来的帽子。At day's end, the troops from the Great Hall of the People were ordered back into the building. But though the army was apparently retreating once more, a decision had been made for a full-scale military assault. On the evening of June 3rd, troops and armored personnel carriers began converging on the center of the city. Far from the square on Chang'an Avenue, the Avenue of Eternal Peace, the great east-west thoroughfare, troops encountered crowds at every intersection. This time, they would not be stopped. Even after the soldiers opened fire, Many people couldn't believe they were using live ammunition. The crowds blocking the intersections didn't always disperse when fired on, or they ran away but came back to yell at the troops. The sound of gunfire attracted even larger crowds. We heard over the student loudspeakers that there was a state of emergency in Tiananmen. They called on people to go and show their support. He wanted to go at once, but I wouldn't let him. I said, you're just a high school student. What difference can you make? As I watched the government warnings on TV, I became very scared, but it just made him want to go all the more. I tried to hold him back, but he was so much taller and stronger than me. I couldn't stop him. All along Chang'an Avenue, troops encountered barricades and crowds throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails. After an intersection was cleared, troops moved more quickly. A young woman with a home video camera recorded the troops passing Fuxing Man intersection, about two miles west of the square. <laughs> At that time, all was still quiet at the monument. Porter Jen said that it was like being in the eye of the storm. A hurricane raged all around. But where we were, by our hunger strike tent, things were relatively calm. This song is called The Beautiful Chinese. The students and the people of Beijing have done amazing things this past month. They've presented a beautiful image of the Chinese to the rest of the world. The government's intentions are now clear. There's nothing more to be said. The important thing right now is our unity and the improvement of our own organizations. In the past, I have debated with a lot of people in my writings. I 
hope that in a moment like this, we can put all our differences behind us. Who will decide the fate of China? The answer is, the people will prevail. Around 11 o'clock, two hours before the main body of the troops arrived, a single armored personnel carrier drove into the square. Workers in Beijing residents stopped it. Someone hit it with a Molotov cocktail and caught fire. The fire hardly slowed it down. Frankly, I was scared and got out of its way. Everyone got out of its way. The official loudspeakers around the square suddenly came on and announced the emergency orders of the martial law troops. They said that the government was determined to suppress the counter-revolutionary violent rioting at all costs. The huge square, which had been filled with so many people, suddenly was emptying before my eyes. Only those of us on the monument remained. It really was eerie. That night, I was at a friend's house. She came home around 11 o'clock and said the soldiers had opened fire at Mushidi intersection and tanks were moving through the streets. I knew some of my students were still in the square. I had to go there. I arrived at the square around midnight and found all 12 of my students. I decided to stay with them and do whatever I could to help prevent bloodshed. Pushing the crowds before them, the troops now reach the stretch of Chang'an Avenue that lies between Tiananmen Gate and the square. We wanted to see what was happening, so we headed south and ran smack into some soldiers. They weren't shooting into the sky or at the ground, they were shooting straight at us. Five workers beside me fell. At first we said, come on guys, stop fooling around and get up. But then we saw the blood. Some had been shot in the chest, some in the head. I rushed back to the workers' headquarters. Though I was really scared, I still managed to burn all the membership lists. By now, many people, no one knows how many, had been killed or wounded. So far, most of the casualties were bystanders and people blocking the advance of the troops.
Having surrounded Tiananmen Square, the soldiers halted and awaited further orders. When taunted by the crowd, they fired. At around three o'clock in the morning, several thousand students sat down at the monument. They wanted to stay to the very end. A lot of blood had already been shed that night, but most of the students in the square hadn't seen anything, so they didn't know what to believe. Everyone imagined that the soldiers would try to drive us away with clubs, and we would just sit there without budging and let the blood flow. Some students handed me a big padded coat and a helmet and said, Mr. Ho, you're too skinny. You won't be able to stand big clubs or rubber bullets. Here, use this coat for padding. Everyone thought they'd only use rubber bullets. Then sometime after two o'clock, a couple of doctors and students came running back to the monument and told us that the soldiers were using real bullets. Things were getting more tense all the time. Many workers whose friends had been killed in the streets gathered at the monument. They were very angry and cried, you students can talk about non-violence all you want, but our brothers and sisters have been killed. They pulled knives on us and told us to shut up. One guy had a semi-automatic rifle. Some student guards and I took it from him. I was terrified. If any gunshots were fired from the monument, the troops would have had an excuse to gun everybody down. So I tried to smash it on the marble railing of the monument. The students at the monument faced a dilemma. If they stayed and resisted, many might be killed. But if they left, would they be betraying the many workers and citizens who had already died to protect them and support their stand? We heard Chai Ling's voice over the loudspeaker. She said, those who want to leave should leave, and those who want to stay should stay. Chai Ling wanted to stay. We felt that Chai Ling's approach might be disastrous. People who wanted to leave couldn't do so safely, and those who stayed would be left in greater danger. We came up with a plan to negotiate with the troops. We thought we should send two people and ask Chai Ling to send another two representatives from the student headquarters. Together, we would ask the army to give us enough time to leave the square. At around 3.30, the four people on the hunger strike came to talk to the students. They said, blood is being spilled all over the city. More than enough blood has already been shed to awaken the people. We know you're not afraid of dying, but leaving now doesn't mean that you're cowards. Chai Ling told us she had heard that leading government reformers hoped that the students would stay on the square until daybreak. So Liu Xiaobo told her, I don't care if it's true or not, but no leader has the right to gamble with thousands of students' lives at the square. Finally, our student headquarters told them, you can go ahead and negotiate, but you can't represent us. 
So we went ourselves. We got into a van and drove only a few seconds before we saw the soldiers, all lined up on Chang'an Avenue. As we got closer, the soldiers pointed their guns at us. They didn't know what we were up to. A few minutes later, an officer appeared. He listened to what we had to say and went to report to his superiors. He came back and told us that they had agreed to our request. He said, we hope you can convince the students to leave the square. We rushed back to the monument to tell the students. Their opinions were divided. There was little time to debate. The troops sequestered in the nearby Great Hall of the People now came out and moved toward the monument. Soldiers with guns at the ready converged on the students from all directions. The soldiers came right up in front of us. They were in full battle gear. The students all stood up. I was in the front row with a gun pointing straight at my chest. It was only a few inches away. The soldiers looked really mean. At the time, I was simply stunned. I didn't feel a thing. I can't imagine what would have happened had they really opened fire. I was in charge of the vote to determine whether we should leave. I said, on the count of three, those who want to go, shout go. Those who want to stay, shout stay. I couldn't tell which side was louder. I knew those who wanted to leave would be ashamed to shout very loud, while those who wanted to stay would shout with all their might. Because of this situation, I felt that when the two sides sounded about the same, most likely more people voted to leave. So I announced the decision to leave. occupying the square for more than three weeks, all the remaining students and their teachers and supporters left Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square was empty, but skirmishes between the people and the army went on sporadically for several days. There were more deaths on both sides. We filed out of the square from the southeast corner. I was near the end of the line. When we turned the corner at the concert hall, several tanks came up from behind. Suddenly, we heard shouts of panic. We looked back and saw people scrambling to get away as a tank turned around right in the middle of the crowd. Then we heard screaming and crying. We ran as fast as we could, afraid that the tank was going to run over us. A student I knew, he was not from my university, practically crawled out from under the tank. Two of his classmates were crushed.
His father and I waited at the university gate all night. At about six in the morning, one of his classmates came back and told us that around 11 o'clock he'd been hit by a bullet and had bled a lot. He didn't know which hospital my son had been taken to. I knew I'd never see him alive again. Ever since April, when the first wall posters appeared on campus, I sensed that something terrible might happen. And finally, it did. It happened to me, a person who had always tried to avoid trouble. I lost my son. Within a week of June 4th, the army was firmly in control of the city. The government then began a much harder job, re-establishing its authority and credibility. Arrests began immediately. Those caught throwing rocks at the troops or setting fire to army vehicles were tried and summarily executed. The government compiled wanted lists of leading participants in the movement. Pictures of the 21 most wanted activists were shown repeatedly on TV. When the most wanted list was broadcast, I was on a boat bound for Nanjing. I wasn't the kind of person who could take life on the run. I wanted to return to Beijing and hide because I had so many friends there. I thought, if I got arrested, so be it. As soon as I came back to Beijing, they got me. Despite her efforts to dissuade students from prolonged street action, Dai Qing was among those arrested. She was jailed for 10 months. The crime of counter-revolution is very peculiar. What counts is not your actions, but your intention. I said, my intention was to help our country democratize. But they said, everything you did shows that your intention was to overthrow the government, so you're a counter-revolutionary. Case closed. When I was in jail, I debated with my interrogators. They insisted that the movement was premeditated and well-planned. I told them it wasn't. I said that if conditions existed in our country for people to premeditate and plan such a huge movement, then the Communist Party would have been long gone, vanished without a trace. Liu Xiaobo, the teacher and critic who took part in the final hunger strike, was jailed for 21 months. Xian when I left, I thought I would never see my daughter again. She stood in the doorway. She grabbed my clothes, so I played with her and said, bye-bye. No one else was at home. 
If my mother knew I was leaving, she would never have let me go. I slipped out when she went out to do the shopping. I said to my daughter, say bye-bye to Mama, and pretended not to be sad. After I left Beijing, I was among farmers. They said to me, son, don't be afraid. We'll hide you now just like we hid the communists during the war against Japan. Back then, weren't the Japanese all powerful? And we didn't let them find the communists. And now the communists are all powerful. But we'll never let them find you. Almost as soon as the struggle over Tiananmen Square ended, the struggle over the story of what happened there began. The official account was this. No one had died during the clearing of the square at dawn on June 4th. In the approaches to the square, some ruffians who had incited counter-revolutionary violence had been killed, as had a small number of innocent bystanders. The government went to extraordinary lengths to hunt down and punish anyone whose story strayed from the official line. One outraged bystander telling atrocity stories to a crowd was interviewed by ABC News. The Chinese government intercepted the satellite relay and used part of the interview in a nationwide broadcast. It called on informers to turn the man in. He was spotted in his hometown, hundreds of miles from Beijing. Chao Bin was sentenced to 10 years in prison. His case was a warning to all. There was only one correct version of events, the government's version. Protesters who had been at the square gave differing accounts of what had happened. Chai Ling, hiding somewhere in China, sent her story out via Hong Kong. And now here is the full 40-minute message in which Chai Ling recounts what happened between June 3rd and June the 4th. Chi some people said that 200 died in the square, and others claim that 2,000 died there. There are also stories of tanks in the square running over students who were trying to leave. I have to say that I did not see any of that. I don't know where those people did. I myself was in the square until 6.30 in the morning. I kept thinking, are we going to use lies to attack an enemy who lies? Aren't facts powerful enough? To tell lies against our enemy's lies only satisfies our need to vent our anger. But it's a dangerous thing to do. 
Maybe your lies will be exposed, and you'll be powerless to fight your enemy. Chai Ling's 40-minute message ended with a call for the Chinese people to rise up. There was no mass uprising. In the weeks after June 4th, the government tried to clean away the evidence of the movement and its suppression. People stopped talking publicly about what they had seen and done in the spring of 1989. At one point, everyone got involved in the movement. Even many party organizations took part. But as soon as it became clear that the government was in control, the movement disappeared as quickly as it had emerged. So many people started saying the opposite of what they really thought, and they rationalized it. I have no choice but to go along. This situation is not essentially different from what happened at the height of the movement. Words became more radical day by day, actions more irresponsible. Because in a crowd, no one felt the need to take individual responsibility. And when the tide suddenly turned, they didn't have the inner strength to stand by what they had said. These two extremes are actually two sides of the same coin. The legacy of the movement at Tiananmen is that it made us think. There are two ways of going about change. One is the large-scale mass movement, romantic and grand, which aims to solve major problems overnight. The other method is gradual, grassroots, solidly grounded. It looks for cracks in the system and introduces specific democratic practices which don't necessarily carry a big label saying democracy. Which one is more effective in changing China, in changing the course of Chinese history? I compare the 1989 democracy movement to an unripe fruit. People were so hungry that they were desperate. When they suddenly discovered a fruit, they pounced on it and swallowed it whole. Then they got a stomach ache and a bitter taste in the mouth. So should they have eaten the fruit? You can say they shouldn't have, but they were hungry. And if you say they should have, what they ate was still green, inedible. Shortly after June 4th, Deng Xiaoping appeared on television to praise the army for its heroic efforts. Deng Xiaoping had presided over a decade of profound economic transformation, and he had many times shielded reform from the attacks of hardliners. Even after the crackdown of 1989, he would continue to push for reforms. More than once, Deng had suffered from the absolute power wielded by top leaders in China. But his reforms stopped short of limiting his own power, for good and for evil. Faced with a crisis, he reached for the old weapons. Deng may have wanted to be remembered as a man who understood the needs of the Chinese people, the grand architect of reform. But the Beijing massacre will forever be a part of his legacy. In the government's account, Tiananmen Square was now returned to the people. Once again, the revolution had been sanctified by the blood of martyrs. State ceremonies paid tribute to the soldiers who died and honored their families. All this talk about children being the flowers of the motherland, the hope of the nation, it's all for show. When they feel that it's in the interest of the party and the state, they bring on the bayonets, machine guns, and tanks. 
I can't watch any of that stuff on TV. It hurts too much. A life is a life. Why are people treated so differently? All my son asked for was a little equality, a little freedom, and it cost him his life. Communism was once a shared ideal held in the face of oppression and injustice. The actual political and social systems built in its name fell far short of its promise. For a long time before the killings in Beijing, communism was losing credibility around the world. It no longer grips the minds and imaginations of the Chinese people. But the Communist Party has not thereby lost its power power without faith leaves a vacuum that can quickly fill with anger, resentment, and despair. After my son's death, I became suicidal. I had to struggle to get through each day. I thought about other mothers like myself and young wives who'd lost their husbands, young children who'd lost their fathers. I wanted to look for them so that we could give each other comfort and support. Should we simply wait for another chance to start a democracy movement like 1989? Would that save China? I don't think so. The only way to change our situation is for each one of us to make a personal effort. Every small action counts. When people abandon hope for a perfect future and faith in great leaders, they are returned to the common dilemmas of humanity. And there, in personal responsibility, in civility, in making sacred the duties of ordinary life, another path may be found. On the hundredth day after my son's death, I brought his ashes back home. He's been here ever since. One day I want him to be buried with the others who fell with him. I'm hoping that day will come, and I'm working towards it.